All right, folks, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? God bless you. Today is a good day. I have, uh, as you know, if you've been following, I've kind of got away from the PowerPoints for a while. Today I'm zoomed in. Got a power, I'm going to PowerPoint your brains out, right? Are you ready? I want to show you something here. You know the theme of this Christmas series has been, if you don't get Christmas, you don't get Jesus. I have been so convicted, and I think a confirmation of the Holy Spirit to walk through this, PowerPoint this for you. I always normally <coughs> tell you, excuse me, to get your Bibles out, but I'm going to do it all for you today. I'm going to put it on the screen. I want you to follow through. You, this is going to be more like a teaching series than it is going to be <coughs> excuse me, anything else today because that's just the way I feel like doing it, all right? So here we go. We're going to talk about the virgin birth and, the, and, and original sin and why this is so important. Again, if you don't get what's happening at Christmas, if you don't get the virgin birth, if you don't get this Emmanuel God with us, then you won't get Jesus and you'll only know about some prophet or some guy. All right, now, one of my favorite uh, hymns or uh, Christmas songs that we sing is Silent Night. And if you notice, I have it on the screen for you. Look at it. The first verse goes, Silent night, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild. Now, let me suggest to you, one of the things we do is I like to stop and say, oh my gosh, especially in the Bible. What did I just read? Think about it. Round yon virgin, mother and child. Let me suggest to you that familiarity with something often causes us to look past profundity. In other words, if you don't have, you, 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 can't, you can't have a virgin mother outside of the natural realm of humanity. In other words, outside of a miracle, you can't have both a virgin and a mother. It's the equivalent of calling someone a single wife. Yet how can a wife be a wife if she is single, which according to natural law, Mary cannot truly be a mother if she is a virgin. All right? Now, obviously, the reality of the virgin birth is what makes Jesus' birth not merely natural, but supernatural. Now, as you probably know, again, the theme for this Christmas series, if you don't get Christmas, you don't get Jesus. And what I mean by that is simply this. If you don't understand the doctrine of the virgin birth... If you don't understand the doctrine of original sin, I'm going to look at these today, all right? If you don't understand the pre-existence of Christ, in other words, Christ before the manger, the pre-existence of God, the fact that Jesus always existed with the Father, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in the beginning, right? Then you will likely miss what happened at Christmas when Jesus was born, or as John says, look at this, we saw this in John John 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Below there I have the message version. I love that. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. That's what happened at Christmas. And that, that is just, this is why I, I am fearful that many critics, and I think uninformed Christians or people that just claim Christianity, they view this virgin birth as some accessory narrative that's been tacked on to the story of Jesus just to mystify the divinity of Christ. In other words, they've never really looked. They've just been told and, yeah, whatever, they doubt. Folks, in other words, yes, some people look at the virgin birth as a fascinating event highlighted at Christmas time, yet they don't really understand it. Today, I really want, I'm going to just lay this, lay this out for you, right? I want you to understand how necessary and foundational, right, the Christmas narrative is to our true Christian faith. Now, may I submit to you that being ignorant of the virgin birth is an example of what I would call theological illiteracy. Now, again, I'm not saying anybody's stupid. Don't call me stupid. Here, here's the deal. Some people have just never stopped, dropped, and rolled and thought about this. Like, all right, what am I really, what do I really believe? I see the Christmas card. You see the, the manger. You see Joseph and Mary. You see the stars and the shepherds and the wise men. What, what is that? 
oh, that's, that's Jesus born in a manger. Okay, what is that? that? That's what I want to get to today. In other words, to understand my theme, if you don't get Christmas, you don't get Jesus, it's in fact a necessary element you have got to get. You have to understand the virgin birth in order to be born again. Now, today, I, I want to show you why the miracle of the virgin birth is at this is at the center of the gospel message of Christmas and salvation. And in fact, I want to demonstrate to you that without this virgin birth, right, no man or woman could ever be saved. Without the virgin birth, the miracles of Jesus Christ would be useless. The cross would not matter, and the resurrection would not be possible. All without that little postcard, what you see, the virgin birth. All right, are you ready? Get ready for PowerPoints. Now, I just want to encourage you, you know, you can go back, follow along with me, and then if you want to go back, run the video again, pause it, look at the scriptures, look at the points I put up. What I don't want to do is I don't want to try to cram something down your throat without you understanding, really getting a hold of it, all right? So at the sake of just doing this more as a teaching session, I want you to be able to get a hold of this and be transformed this Christmas if you need this transformation. All right, here we go. Historically, we know that the forefathers, the virgin birth was at the essential foundation of the church. The Apostles' Creed says this. It's on the board for you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. And it goes on. So that's the Apostles' Creed that was established like A.D. 341. I also have... The Nicene Creed up here, which was 381, listen to this. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became a man. Incarnate, literally meaning in flesh and blood, in humanity, just like you and I. Now, what these creeds mean way back from the beginning is that ultimately, our forefathers, the theologians of the past, they understood the significance of the supernatural birth, the virgin birth at Christmas. And I think more importantly, they knew that a natural birth would dismantle the entire gospel and turn the good news of Jesus Christ into some historical, some insignificant historical event. In other words, by making these creeds, they did it to preserve the doctrinal understanding of what happened that they knew about the virgin birth. All right, so here's what they believed. If the virgin birth could be dismantled or explained away, or if its importance could be minimized, then there's room for other things to take its place, other explanations, rumors, or theories, right? Other people, satanic things. And that's why they ran it and established it. This importance, I believe, is why the satanic attack has come down over the years with all of the additional, listen to this, all the additional holiday beliefs and character stories added to the season. You know, you have Santa Claus, you have reindeers, Frosty the Snowman, the Grinch, and you have a multitude of other religions doing other things and practicing and trying to pull the focus off the virgin birth at this time of the year. Why? I'll tell you why. The bottom line is this. We saw this in the Truth Project. Powerful. Look at this. This is what Del Tackett told us. Why this postmodern world view tries to go back. They call it historical revisionism. If they can go back in history and tweak and redefine what happened there, then they can control the narrative today. And if you control the narrative today, you control what is truth for tomorrow? Here's a good example. This gender identification thing, folks, please. I don't hate anybody, but if you can claim that somebody isn't created, either male or female, and they have the power to identify what they are, then there is no creator. Therefore, there is no creation, no God of accountability. Therefore, whatever goes, goes. Whatever makes you feel good is your relevant truth. Do you see it? It's a satanic lie right from the pits of hell. Right from the pits of hell. And we so strongly saw this in the Truth Project, right? In other words, the devil wants to control truth. He wants to control the conversation. 
That's why Christmas had become so worldly and happy and joyous. Look, many people don't think of the devil as the sweet, loving goombaya. Hey, have another drink. Have a good time. The hors d'oeuvres are on me. Look, it, whatever he can do to dilute the truth, change the truth, to nullify the truth, or not make the truth of your very salvation the important thing, then he's done his job. I hope you see this. Oh, please get this. This is why the virgin birth is so critical to the gospel. Without it, you don't have a savior. You only have some good man who once lived and did good things. And watch this. A lot of people recognize Jesus. Oh, yeah, he lived. He existed. We have writings. But he was just a good man. He was a good prophet. He did good things. No. He's the word of God. Second person of the triune nature of God. Came to earth. Became flesh and blood. Right? Right? In the beginning, he spoke man into existence. He brought the dirt, dust from the ground, breathed into his nostrils life. And at the second Adam, when he comes back, he comes to earth through his creation. Now watch this. Wow. All right. Now, as I prayed about this, I thought, all right, one of the things we have to do is we have to go back to the doctrine of original sin because that's where the heart of this matter lies. All right. Now, when I say the doctrine of original sin, what I'm referring to is the biblical teaching that sin is not just an act or a choice, but it is also a condition that has been handed down from Adam, the first human being created, to all mankind. Now think about that. It's not just an, an act or a choice. It's a condition. What does that mean? What that all means is this. When Adam sinned in the garden, his physical and spiritual nature was corrupted by disobeying God's commandment and covenant with him as a representative of all mankind. Now, now stop and think, right? Because of that, because of his fall, through his not obeying God's word, Adam and Eve, their bodies changed. They were created eternal. There was no death. There was no sin. There was no penalty. God just gave him the law of God, the word of God. You can have everything, do this, have kids, have kids, be fruitful, subdue the earth, but just don't eat from one tree. And because they disobeyed, what happened was his soul was no longer spiritually alive in the presence of God, but would now be separated from God. Sin and death entered in from being an eternal being to being a, a person, a being that would eventually die. Separation is also an essential theological theme in Scripture because separation is how death is made manifest. Now watch this, all right? For example, Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Remember Solomon, the Bible says he was the smartest guy who ever lived and who ever lived. Right? He said this, then in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. In other words, death is the separation of the body from the soul. For anyone who's witnessed death, I've been there. I've been there multiple times when people have taken their last breath. The concept is not difficult to grasp because when the soul leaves and the body dies, that, that person is, is there's, there's an appearance, there's a change. You, you, you can't explain it, but you can perceive it. Something's different. I remember my pastor, Pastor Ron Hasty. Um, I remember going down, at, viewing the casket, viewing Ron at Evergreen Christian Church back then. And Janice was there, and she came up, and we were looking at Pastor, and she said, you know what, isn't it amazing? That's not Ron. He's gone. And I was looking at that old rolled up tent in that casket, and he was only 62. The likeness, it wasn't him. He was gone. You can see it. Now, if you look at the other flip side of the coin, spiritual death is defined as the separation of the soul from God. Right? Do I have this out here for you? Let me put this up. Here we go. All right? So you have separation of the body from the soul, and then you have separation of the soul from God. Isaiah said, but your, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Has made a separation between you. Namely, because God is spirit, holy, and is without sin. The soul of a sinner cannot be in his presence. Therefore, sin acts 
sin acts as the means to detach or separate us from God. The Bible teaches that because Adam sinned and was separated from God, all who were born of Adam, now watch, every generation born of Adam, we were born into that separation, that sin nature. We were born into the sin nature. And that sin nature is a separation from God. It's a separation from God. Consequently, when the soul is separated from God, who is the source of spiritual life, the soul is dead. And as you all know, all humankind is born of Adam and his fallen nature or separated from God. Do you see that? Folks, it's not my opinion. It's the Word of God. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians. I got it mapped out for you. He describes the spiritual state of a person before Christ. And this is how Paul lays it down. He says this, Ephesians 2, verse 1. Once you were under God's curse, doomed forever for your sins. In other words, he's talking about your sin nature. Once you were, as you were born of Adam into the sin nature, you were doomed. You were under God's curse for your sins. You went along with the crowd and were just like all the others, full of sin, obeying Satan the mighty prince of the power of air who is at work right now in the hearts of those who are against the Lord. How many of you know that you may not willfully even understand you're obeying Satan, but if you're separated from God and following the world, you are. Verse 3, all of us used to be just as they are, Paul says, but our, our lives expressing the evil within us, doing every wicked thing that our passions or our evil thoughts might lead us into, we started out bad being born with evil intentions and we're under God's anger just like everyone else. But well, watch this, those underlines are mine. But God is so rich in mercy, He loved us so much that even though we were spiritually dead, watch this, and doomed by our sins, He gave us back our lives. He gave it back to you. He gave back our lives when He raised Christ from the dead. Only by His undeserved favor have we ever been saved. How does He raise Christ from the dead? He has to first be born of a new nature. Oh, you got to understand this. If Christ was born of Adam, he would have been born into a sin nature. Stop and think. Just common sense. So what Paul is saying is this. Just as you were born into a sin nature and obeying Satan, whether you knew it or not, doing your own thing as you saw fit, when Jesus came, when God came to earth just like us through the virgin birth and endured the cross and rose from the dead through Him and Him alone, we are now saved. Man, we're big on salvation. We're big on Easter and the, and the penalty for sins. But how did it all happen? It happened at Christmas. Jesus Christ had to be born of the virgin without a sin nature. Folks, this is the reason Jesus told Nicodemus. Remember this? We saw this so powerfully back in John uh, chapter 3. And we'll go back. We, we stopped in chapter 9. But we'll go back. Look what Jesus said. Truly, su truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Remember Nicodemus, representing the Old Testament covenant, the Old Covenant, comes to Jesus at nighttime, who is the New Covenant, and says, Jesus, we know you're from God because you do great things, but who are you? What are you? And that's when he says, Nick, you've got to get out of that whole religious system. You've got to be born of water and of spirit, I believe in reference, he's talking there to the baptism of John. You have to repent and put away the mountains and the, level up the, the valleys and make a smooth path for the Lord, according to Isaiah, and prepare your heart, what? To be born again by the Spirit. Now, the Bible teaches us that a renewed spiritual life, the reuniting of the soul with God, is only found in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That's what salvation is all about when we pray salvation prayer. However, the Bible also teaches that a person remains spiritually dead by their unwillingness to repent and trust in Christ. They will experience what is called the second death. Now watch this. All of the people, not, and we're not talking about crooks and robbers and thieves, but we are, but we're talking about good people. If that soul is separated from God, then there's only one destination for them when they take their last breath. The book of Revelation confirms this. Revelation says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, 
the detestable. What are the faithless? Faithless, a lot of just good folks that just, oh, I don't see it. It's all about Santa Claus. It's not about Jesus, Christmas. The detestable, as for murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This is the second death. Now, stick with me. Here's what we know. Ultimately, there are two important truths from Scripture about this through the doctrine of original sin. First of all, Adam's sin was the reason Adam died, physically and spiritually. It's also the reason why all of humanity is born spiritually dead, needing to be born again, and will experience physical death. Look at what Paul says here in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, who is that? One man sin entered into the world, Adam. Therefore, just as one man, just as, just as through Adam sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, who's an all men? Well, you are. Because all sinned. Sin nature. In other words, because of Adam's fall, all of us, it spread to all of us. Why? DNA tests go all the way back, right? We're all connected through our humanity to Adam. And until Christ changed, until Christ came, nothing had changed there. Look at Romans 5.19. For as... Through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, Adam. Even so, through the obedience of the one, right, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Look at that. Get that into your spirit. Get these scriptures into your spirit. Get them highlighted. Get them circled. Get them marked in your Bible. Wow. Let me explain what this means. Adam was the human race's covenant representative before God in the covenant of works that was established in the Garden of Eden. He was our daddy. When with the first man and woman, God established the law for a man to follow, part of which was not to eat of the forbidden tree, of which we know in Genesis Adam and Eve failed to do when they were deceived by the devil. So I want you to think about this now, okay? Because this is key. After all, after the fall... All humanity was, in a real sense, genetically in Adam. And we just talked about this DNA thing. In other words, all descendants of Adam and Eve, when Adam sinned and broke that covenant with God in the garden, we all sinned with him or in him and were born into his sin nature. Therefore, once Adam was genetically corrupted, no longer eternal, and now destined to physically die, we, all generations thereafter, were also born genetically corrupted. Corrupted. Yet, come on. <laughs> Yet, and here's the good news. When Jesus came to earth through his creation, this is what's so powerful. When Jesus comes to earth, the 23 chromosomes of the first Adam, original, eternal, and the 23 of the virgin, Jesus enters the world Right? Not through the procreation of man since the garden, but by the power of the Holy Spirit and is born into a new nature, a sinless nature. Adam falls. We're all born into a corrupted, sinful nature. Now, Jesus comes, clothes himself with humanity, totally like us, conceived, born at Christmas, lives a sinless life, lays his life down as a blood sacrifice so that through him we can have redemption and that separation of the soul with God is redeemed. Folks, when Jesus came to earth through the virgin birth, we were given the opportunity to once again be genetically connected to God through the second or last Adam, Jesus Christ. This is why scripture teaches it. I have it on the screen. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Look at that. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. How do you come alive? You accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and that separation is gone. 
This is also why we need to switch from Adam, who failed to keep the covenant works of God, to Christ, who kept the covenant works of God perfectly. We need to go from the man who was not righteous to the man who is righteous, Jesus Christ. Again, a lot of scripture here, but you can come back to this. Watch again. Paul gave us most of the doctrinal uh, scriptures and, and letters in the, Old, in the New Testament. Look at what he says here, Romans 5 again. And what a difference between man's sin and God's forgiveness. For this one man, Adam, brought death to many through his sin, but this one man, Jesus Christ, brought forgiveness to many through God's mercy. Somebody say mercy. Do you want his mercy? Do you have his mercy? We're going to pray if you don't at the end of this message. Verse 16. Adam's one sin brought the penalty of death to many, while Christ freely takes away sins and gives glorious life instead. Verse 17, the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to be king over all. But all who will take God's gift of forgiveness and acquittal are kings of life because of this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's sin brought punishment to all, but Christ's righteousness makes men right with God so they can live. They can live. Verse 19, Adam caused many to be sinners because he disobeyed God, and Christ caused many to be made acceptable to God because he obeyed. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin, the Bible says. <laughs> Isaiah saw it. God told him, Isaiah prophesied, Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and, she will call, and he will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. That's the hope. That's the joy. That's the, that's the virgin birth. Isaiah saw it. He saw it hundreds of years prior. So here's what this all means, right? This Messiah would be fully human and fully God. He would have his humanity from his mother and his divinity from God the Father. But most of all, he would not inherit the corruption curse or covenant representation of Adam. Instead, he would be conceived by the Holy Spirit, free of sin, legally adopted by an earthly father of the tribe of Judah, born of the line of David, and would stand before the world as a new Adam. Namely, he would be a new creation, able to keep the law with perfection, to keep his life as a ransom for many, and to spiritually reproduce others who are not like the first Adam, but like him. I know this is a lot, but that's why I've mapped this out for you on the PowerPoint. Do I act excited? I'm excited. You know why? I got this. I received him. I've been redeemed. I've been brought back into the fellowship. I'm not separated from God through my corrupt, sinful nature. Whew. All right, let me close with this. Stick with me. Are you with me? Say amen. 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 All right, let me close with this. So how does this all come together? Why is the virgin birth of Jesus absolutely necessary? Why does the devil want to collude it and pollute it with all this other junk and trees and kringles and white Christmases and goombaya and all these other false religions do all this other garbage at this time of the year? It's to draw attention away. Again, if you can tweak history, you can control the narrative and then... Right? Control the future. Here we go. The scriptures revealed. If Jesus were born of Joseph, he would have had original sin. He would have been born physically corrupted, spiritually dead. Back up. Oh, I got to go one more. Here we go. Got this. Watch this. I'll give you these points. If Jesus were born of Joseph, he would have had original sin. So he would have had been so he would have been born physically corrupted, spiritually dead, sinful, and cursed. And if that were the case, Jesus would not could not pay for the sins of the world. Think about this. Because he would have to pay for his own sins, for his own life. Therefore, the cross would not be a moment of redemption, but simply the passing away of another sinner. All right? And if that was the result, there would be no justification could be given by faith. 
No redemption could be bought by his blood. No wrath could be satisfied by his death. And no resurrection could occur to validate his righteousness. Consequently, folks, listen, without the virgin birth, all of Christianity unravels. I, I hope you can get the intensity of what I'm trying to say. If you don't get Christmas, man, you don't get Jesus. And if you don't get Jesus, you don't have salvation. You are separated from God because you're genetically connected through your sinful choices and through your sin nature born into this world through the first Adam and not the second Adam. Whew. This Christmas season, we don't want to celebrate that Christ was born, but how Christ was born. Think about that. This Christmas season, we don't want to, we don't want to just celebrate, right, that Christ was born. But you've got to know how he was born. He is a new creation able to produce new creations. He is the first fruits of the harvest to come, the firstborn from the dead, and for those who trust in the one who reconciles them to God for eternity. For eternity. How long is eternity? That's a long time. Folks, let me encourage you. I know this is a lot of stuff. I would encourage you, invest in yourselves. If it's confusing for you, if you're, if you're just sitting there going, I'm lost, I don't know, that, that was fast. Back up, back it up, back it up. Take each slide, take each statement, look at it. Pray, God, open my mind, open my mind, open my mind. Let me see how this works. Go back and watch the 23 and Me or that. I talked about how we are genetically connected to the second Adam through our humanity. But it doesn't do us any good unless we recognize it and accept Him. And when it comes to the virgin birth, you can't look past this. You can't minimize it. You, you don't want to say, oh well. No. Get a hold of it. Perceive it. Read the scriptures. Read the narratives. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He was, he was conceived. Wow. How amazing. Bottom line, again, if you don't get Christmas, <laughs> if you don't get Christmas, folks, you don't get Jesus. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. All right, now listen. Here's what I want to do. I know it's a lot, but let me pray for you, okay? Let me just pray that you will, your mind is going to be opened up to this. It's not that difficult to look at. And it's not that difficult to see. The Apostle Paul and the anointing Holy Spirit lays it right down, right there in Romans. Go back and read the scriptures again. Look at them. Read through that chapter, Romans 5. You can get this. You will get this. The bottom line is this. If you stay connected to Adam only, through your sin nature, you're separated. The only way to get to heaven is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The virgin birth, when you understand that, then you understand how you need the Savior as the toning sacrifice for your sins. And then it all starts to make sense. I know a lot of people get Easter, but they just don't, they can't wrap their mind around the virgin birth. Also with the pre-existence of Christ, remember, this virgin birth wasn't the beginning of Jesus, but it was his identification with flesh, sinless flesh, to be able to go to the cross to set us free. That's your salvation. That's your hope. Let me pray for you. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, anybody listening to my voice, oh, Jesus, oh, dear God, thank you, Lord. Lord, we want to end that separation right now. There's a lot of good people who just have no clue. They have a clue now if they've listened. We need to end that separation. Just as many died through the one man, Adam, so many will live through the one man, Jesus Christ. It's through that sinless sacrifice, that perfect humanity that went to the cross and shed his blood that we are now redeemed. We go back to the garden if we want to live eternally. Yes, these bodies will die, but that soul will be destined to be present with the Lord instead of a Christless eternity of separation. If that's you out there today, just pray after me. Dear Heavenly Father, come into my life. End the separation. End the separation right now. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the gospel narratives. 
I believe in the sinless life of Jesus Christ. I believe in the cross. I believe in the sacrifice that you paid for my life, and I accept that right now for the forgiveness of my sin and the redemption of this sin nature, God. And I receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Woohoo! <laughs> it's so good. It's just so good. I wish you could be here with me. I'm here in the studio. There's nobody here. Well, there's angels in here. People, I can sense their presence. And I'm just excited. Preaching to a camera. Come on. Preaching to you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Christmas's Island is on a roll. Oh, my gosh. So many cars. Uh, join us this weekend. So this is the, what is, today's this, uh, Sunday, what is today? Sunday the 17th, 19th. Yeah, 17th, going to come up on Christmas. Just remember, we will have a, so the 24th, uh, Christmas Eve is a Sunday, we'll have our normal 1030 service, but we're also doing a special Christmas Eve service that night right here at Christmas Island, man. And I just pray for the weather. If it's not pouring down rain, we're going to do something fantastic. Communion, candlelights out along Christmas Island. Oh, my gosh. What a joyous time it's going to be. The fire barn will be fired up. The fire in there, the cookies, the coffee. Go and do your activities, your, your family, and then bring your families down for that special 7 to 8 o'clock, uh, December 24th, right? Sunday, December 24th, 7 to 8 o'clock that night. And join us here. It's going to be glorious, glorious time. Again, our regular services are at 1030 Sunday mornings. If you want to give online, as many people do, it's convenient. Please go to Maytown ag.com maytownag.com you can give tithes offerings uh, you can give to the building fund if you want to be a friends of christmas island and donate to that then just identify your gift as christmas island and it'll get to help fund that again we we receive donations for that we don't charge we just give it away amen amen look if that was you and you prayed that sinner's prayer god bless you god bless you christmas is going to be so much different for you this year uh, let us know. Send us an email. Come and see us, 1030, and help us get you reconnected to the Lord. Amen? Amen. God bless you, and Merry Christmas.